Here's the next one. The world will come to an end at a time only Allah knows about. On the last day, life will perish and then will be resurrected for judgment. So all of life will perish, then resurrected for judgment, and nobody has the assurance of going to Islamic heaven except those who die as martyrs for the cause of Allah, i.e. those who blow themselves up and other innocent people with them. Here's another thing. People's deeds, both good and bad, are constantly recorded by Allah. Those deeds, along with people's beliefs about Allah, will count toward them going to heaven or not going to heaven. Going to heaven or going to hell. And what they do, and I mentioned this last Sunday, is they believe that Allah has a giant set of scales. On one side, he puts your good works and your good beliefs. On this side, the bad stuff you do. And whichever way the scale tips, that's where you go. And there's no assurance until you stand before Allah of which way you're going to go. If you read the biography of Muhammad, he had no assurance that even he, the founder of this religion, was going to go to heaven. He had no assurance. The only definite assurance for an Islamic person is to die as a martyr. That's the only assurance they have. And by the way, they believe in seven levels of hell. Level number five is for Jewish people. Level number six is for Christians. That's where we're going to wind up, according to their theology. We're all going to hell, and we're going to be on level six. We have to take the elevator downstairs, and uh, we go past all the different shops and so forth, and we wind up on the sixth level of hell if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Interesting theology. Here's another one. The Koran demands belief in the prophets before Muhammad, and the prophets include people like Abraham, Moses, and even Jesus. They consider him a prophet. Not the Savior of the world, not the Son of God, but a prophet. And they demand belief in these people as prophets. Here's another one I found very interesting. Initiating hostilities is condemned in the Koran, but, and this is an important but, defending one's property, family, faith, or land is required. Now, hostilities are condemned. That's why the Islamic people say it's a peace-loving religion, because they say we can't initiate hostilities. But you have to catch that other clause, except in defending one's property, family, faith, or land. That's how you explain the Muslim terrorism. They believe that basically they're in the right because they're protecting their land, they're protecting their faith, they're protecting their God, and they see all the world as an enemy against them, and that's why they feel justified in attacking the world at large, and also they feel like the Jews are kind of sitting on their land, and because they're invaders on their land, they feel justified in attacking the Jews. And so they can still say, we don't initiate hostilities, except when it comes to defending our land, which they think is Israel and Jerusalem, and protecting our family and protecting our faith and so forth and so on. So very interesting what the Koran teaches. Those basic things are the concepts found in the Koran, and they form the foundation of this religion called Islam. Let me share with you one last thing. We also need to understand what I call the impasse of the Koran. And what I mean by the word impasse is that both of these books, the Bible and the Koran, they can't both be the Word of God. They can't because they teach different stuff. I mean, they're diametrically opposed to each other. And if the Koran is correct, then the Bible is totally wrong. And if the Bible is correct, then the Koran cannot possibly be truly the inspired Word of Allah, their God. They teach things that are diametrically opposed to each other. Let me give you a couple of examples. First of all, Muslims believe that the Bible has been corrupted across the years, and it's no longer the Word of God. It's been replaced, basically, by the Koran. They especially have a problem with the Apostle Paul. They really feel like Paul corrupted the Bible more than anybody else in history. And the reason they believe that is because Paul talked a lot about grace, G-R-A-C-E. And in the Muslim faith, there's no grace. There's no grace. It's all of works. Good works on one side of the scale, bad works on the other side, good beliefs, bad beliefs, and the way the scale tips is where you go, heaven or hell. But it's based on works. There's no grace there. And they would say to you today that Jesus never talked about grace. But the Apostle Paul corrupted the gospel because he talked about grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we know that from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. We understand the Word of God, but they would say that's the corruption of the Bible. And they feel that it's all because this issue of grace. And so when we stand up and sing Amazing Grace, they would be deeply offended. Because their God's not a God of grace. 
The Quran's not a book of grace. There's no grace in the Quran at all. It's all about works and what we can do to earn our salvation. Here's another thing. The interesting thing about the Quran is that it commands Muslims to read and to respect the Bible. Isn't that amazing that this is a corrupted book, but the Quran commands them to read, to study it, and also to respect. Let me give you a couple of examples. You can jot these down. Surah 29 and verse 46. Surah 29 and 46. Here's what it says. We believe in the revelation which has come down to us and in that which came down to you. Now what came down to them was the Quran. What came down to you, the other people, was the Bible. Our God, they say, in that verse, Surah 29, 46, our God and your God is one. We saw last week that's not true. There's no way that Jehovah Yahweh God can be compatible with Allah. They're completely different gods. So Surah 29, 46 says that we have the word of God. It came down to us and it also came down to them. Here's another one. Surah chapter 5, verse 48. To you we sent the scripture in truth, confirming the scripture that came before it. Now what came before the Quran? The Bible. It predates the Quran. It came before it and guarding it in safety. Muhammad actually instructs in the Quran Muslims to read the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospels. I ask you, where are those found? The Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the books that Moses wrote, the Psalms, and then, of course, the Gospels. Where are they found? In what book? The Bible. So Muhammad said, you guys need to read the Bible. Read these particular ones, the Torah, because that's law, legalism, the Psalms, and also the Gospels. Now, the idea of the Quran is not that it's a brand new revelation from Allah, but it simply explains the Bible and updates the corruption that's found in the Bible today, and it's the full and final revelation of God, Allah, to humankind. That's what they believe about the Quran. Surah 2.4 says that all true believers will read both the Bible and the Quran and will believe in both the Bible and the Quran. And yet they turn around and say the Bible is corrupted. So why would you read a corrupted book? If you got the perfect book, why go back and read the imperfect and the corrupted? It just doesn't make sense. It seems to be a discrepancy in their theology. Here's another one. Islam, like Judaism and Christianity, recognize Abraham as a great patriarch. However, the way they interpret Abraham's life is completely different than Judaism and Christianity. We talked about that last week. They believe the chosen son was not Isaac, as we believe. They believe it was actually Ishmael. We talked about that last week. And Ishmael became the father of the Arabic people, and Isaac became the father of the Jews. That's why they hate the Jews, because they feel like they've misinterpreted Scripture, and they're missing the point that Ishmael is the son of promise. And also the land belongs to Ishmael and his descendants, not to Israel, and they feel justified in attacking that land. One last thing. They also have some unusual teachings about Jesus. Now, they would tell you today they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe he's the Son of God, Savior of the world. They believe he's a prophet. They do believe in the virgin birth, amazingly enough. The Quran talks about Mary having a virgin birth. But what they mean by the virgin birth is not what we mean. It was not a supernatural event. Here's what they mean. They mean that God, Allah, took dirt and he made Jesus. And they would say to us, there's nothing supernatural about that. Just the fact that Jesus didn't have an earthly human mother and father that Allah made him out of dust because the same thing's true of Adam and Eve. They had no earthly human mother or father, so this is not a supernatural event at all. They say that he was born of the virgin, but Allah made him, which means that Jesus is not co-eternal with God. He's not really God. He's a created being, which every false religion, every false cult subscribes to. He's not God in human flesh. They also reject the idea that he died on the cross. They reject the whole concept. And they say people boast about, we killed the Christ. He said that wasn't really Jesus, Muhammad did. That's not really Jesus died on the cross. He just appeared to die on the cross. It was actually Judas Iscariot. And Jesus slipped away somewhere. And one day Jesus will come back. There will be a second coming of Jesus. And when he comes back again, he's going to tell the world that Christianity is wrong and Judaism is wrong. And the entire world needs to submit to Allah. That's what Islam means, submission. And he'll preach that and he'll be killed in those last days when he returns.